I notice people reading a lot of books uh, these days, a particular kind of book in the last couple of years, and that's a, a, they're not exactly studies, they're, they're novels, I guess, uh, romance novels about spirit beings, you know, vampires and people that live in the, quote, Middle Earth area and uh, you know, good vampires, bad vampires, and witches, and werewolves, and I mean, this whole world here, this whole nether world um, seems to be uh, ripe for uh, novelists to mine, and they've uh, probably made a lot of money selling books about these um, individuals, uh, absolutely made up individuals, you know, fantasies. But there are also a lot of books about angels, people talking about angels, and somehow the, the conversation about angels and the conversation about these fantasy beings gets kind of mixed up. And I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of separate those here. Novels are okay, fantasy is okay, uh, but angels are real beings. And we need to understand the difference between the, between the two. Uh, of course, a lot of the material uh, in popular books and paperbacks on the subject of angels is uh, usually based on fables or personal experiences, uh, religious information gathered from sources other than the Bible. Other than the Bible. A lot of books write about angels but don't have their primary source as the, as, uh, uh, the, as the Bible. Of course, the Bible does give information about angels. As fascinating as this might be, uh, I believe we need to limit our ideas about what angels are like and what they do uh, based on God's word. Easy to speculate about them, you know, easy to get lost in that speculation, but we need to kind of stick with what the scriptures say about these beings. If we go beyond the word about angels, we have no guarantee that our conclusions about them will be accurate, no better than some of these novels about these other made up creatures. However, when we remain with the scriptures, despite the little information we have, we can be sure that we have a, a true picture of what angels are really, are really like. Uh, we get a true picture of what uh, God has given us concerning these beings. So what we do know can be summarized you know, as follows. First of all, we know that they are created spiritual beings that have a variety of characteristics. They have a will, they have the ability to communicate, they have individual personality, a variety of supernatural powers, they're pure spirit, we know that about them. Uh, we know that the Bible only mentions a few by name, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, but there are countless numbers of them. We don't know how many, but there are millions of them, apparently. We also know that there's a hierarchy of angels with some being in a higher position than others. We don't know why. We don't have the reason for that. We simply note that from what we read about them in the scriptures. And the Bible tells us that a number of angels led by Satan rebelled against God and were judged, cast out of heaven, and are presently awaiting their final punishment when Jesus returns. We know, we know that about them. A lot of the evil spirits mentioned are fallen angels. And we understand that angels have a major function. In other words, they were created for a certain purpose. They are messengers. Uh, that's what the word angel means, messenger. Uh, they minister or they serve people here on earth in a variety of ways. And of course, especially when you read uh, in um, uh, Isaiah and of course uh, in the book of Revelation to name two, they are before the throne of God praising Him in the heavenly dimension. And so there's those, some, of the, some of the things we know about angels. Now, I, my study tonight, or my lesson tonight, wasn't necessarily about going through all the passages, passages of Scripture that describe what angels do. I want to I wanna another, I wanna take another tack tonight. As I say, I haven't provided all the details and references here, but these facts pretty well cover what the Bible tells us about angels. Now, there are wild stories and movies and testimonials from people who claim to have seen or been saved by an angel, 
But the only thing we know for sure is what God Himself reveals to us. One of the things we do know is that angels are not permitted to reveal themselves without God's permission. So this evening I'd like to build on this basic information that the Bible gives us and list some of the things that in one way or another angels teach us. We don't, we don't think normally that a role of the angel is to teach us, but when we observe them and when we look at what they are doing and how God is using them, well we see that God uses angels to teach us important things and that's my that's my focus tonight in my lesson, very briefly, a couple of things. Well, first of all, angels teach us about humility. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, the writer says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, meaning God, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Now, in 2 Kings, we studied the life of Hezekiah and how in one single night, one single angel destroyed the entire Assyrian army, 185,000 strong, one angel. And we read about angels being transformed into men and delivering messages to human beings. Gabriel appearing to Mary, for example. And angels we see are powerful, intelligent, eternal beings, and yet, and here's my point, and yet in the Hebrew letter we see that God says that He never referred to them as my son. In Romans 8.15 the children of God refer to God as Abba, Daddy, and yet no angel has ever had this relationship with God. The disciples of Jesus, weak and sinful as they are, have a better place than the angels who are superior in intelligence and power, and yet, and here's, here's the point, and yet despite all of this, they accept their role in serving man. You know, the definition of humility is accepting the role that we have been given without murmuring or complaint. It is the ability to love and to serve those who are weaker and undeserving without arrogance, without resentment. You know, it's, it's easy to say, I'm a servant of the king or I work for the president. You know, I'm in the White House and I, I'm a, an advisor to the president or I shine the president's shoes. You know, that's great. You know. But to say, no, well, what I do is I work in the soup kitchen and I, I make the food for homeless people and I wash the dirty clothes of the homeless people. You see, the, it's service. But one service is a little more exalted and you know, gives us a sense of pride than the other. Humility is the ability to put ourselves under, to bear under, to have a reasonable assessment of our talents and our position. Isn't that the problem many times? when there is an argument, when there is a division, when there's fighting, somebody does not have a proper, <laughs> a proper assessment of who they are, what they are, what they're supposed to be doing. Humility is the realization that whatever we have has been given to us. So we can learn about humility from these powerful spiritual beings who have accepted their role as messengers and servants of beings who are inferior to themselves. And despite this, they have joyfully accepted their role because of their faith, because of their service to the Father. So we can learn something. You know, if an angel, this powerful being, can serve little old me, sinful and weak as I am, 
Who am I to get all puffed up if I'm asked to give service to someone else? If I'm asked, even by my own conscience, to kind of zip my lip if someone, quote, inferior to me in a sense, less experience, less maturity, less knowledge, but there are times maybe that I have to just say nothing and allow that person to kind of go on and on. You know what I'm talking about. But we learn that from angels by watching them. Another thing that angels teach us is um, meekness. We learn about meekness from angels. In Jude verse nine, the writer says, but Michael, the archangel, so there, that's where we get this idea of position, not just angel, but archangel, a higher position. But Michael, the archangel, when, disputing, uh, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord rebuke you. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, companion passage here, a little explanation. In Deuteronomy 34, um, that passage tells us that Moses was perfectly healthy when God called him home and that his body was buried in a place where no one could find it. And probably God did this to avoid having the Jews or others from turning the place where he was buried into a shrine or some kind of idol. This may explain the dispute over his body between Michael the archangel and the devil. The devil may have wanted to uh, reveal the place in order to cause the Jews to stumble. Who knows, that's just speculation on my part, but perhaps that's why he, there was this dispute here. In the end, the only word spoken by this powerful being more so than Satan because he is of, of the light and Satan is of the darkness. The only word spoken by Michael the archangel was to call on the Lord to rebuke, in other words, to forbid or to charge Satan with his sin. And so Satan could not provoke Michael the archangel to say or do something which God would not permit him to do. He had the power to destroy Satan, but he didn't have the permission. And so meekness you know, is not the same thing as humility. Not the same thing as humility. Humility you know, is, is to bear under, to know one's place, to accept one's status, if you wish. Meekness is the ability to keep our self-will not only under our control, but under the control of another. You know, self-willed people want their way. They want their way and they want it now. <laughs> Any of you who have had children, and I look around and I think most of you have had, and it, what is the most self-willed thing in the world? Well, a little baby, right? Little baby doesn't care that you worked hard all day at work, mommy, and you're coming home and you're exhausted and you just need a break. No, little baby, they, now, I want to eat now. I want my food now, I want this now. Ah, I want my way now. And of course, with time, you know, we teach them. Self-willed people are people that kind of never got out of that groove. Self-willed people think that their way is the best way, actually think it's really the only way, and they rarely consider that someone else may have a good idea, may have even a better idea. Self-willed people do not take a challenge to their authority very, very well, even when they're not in authority. And so meekness is that quality whereby someone does not eliminate self-will. It's impossible to eliminate self-will. But an individual is ready to allow another's will to dominate their own. Someone is ready to allow another's will to be over one's own 
without complaining, without murmuring. You know, Michael the archangel, he did it with Satan. Jesus did it in the garden. Not my will, but thy will be done. We would have so much less division in marital relationships, friendships, business, church life, if we cultivated more mm, aggressively the, um, the virtue of meekness. The virtue of meekness. I remember someone describing, I don't remember who, it might have been Richard Rogers, I don't know, an old tape, remember Richard Rogers from Sunset, great teacher, he's long gone now, but he, he talked about the 12 apostles and each of them was like a jagged little rock, you know, each having their sharp edges. You, know, you think Peter wanted his way? <laughs> you think he was a guy who was meek? And all the others, the zealot, Matthew the tax collector had money. And he said, Jesus picked all of these jagged rocks and he put them in a bag and he shook them up for three years. And after three, and they bumped against each other and they crashed into each other and they, and then after three years he opened that bag and he pulled out, well, 11 smooth stones, one was lost, and he pulled out 11 smooth stones, no more jagged edges. Isn't that the thing that we like about, not all, but some of our elderly brothers and sisters? A lifetime of Christianity, a lifetime of cultivate, cultivating the character of Christ, and what do you get? You get a person that doesn't have all the rough edges. You get a person that doesn't have all the sharp corners. You get a person that's able to kind of go through the congregation from one person to another, from one situation to another without scratching this person and, and, and chipping that person and bruising that person. Why? Because the character of Christ has been molded and formed in them. And all those rough spots have been sanded off in a, in a lifetime of Christian service and study. Meekness, that's what we like about those people. Sometimes we can't put our finger on it. I like being with them. When I'm with them, I, I feel good. I don't feel like challenged or put down or laughed at or insecure. I just, I enjoy being with them. Why? Usually it's meekness. Usually that's what it is. We can also do it by searching to do God's will in every situation rather than our own will. Practice doing His will not only enables us to submit to Christ, but in a very practical way, it enables us to flex that muscle of meekness, because meekness is a muscle, it's not a weakness, that enables us to submit to the will of someone else. And so we learn that from angels, certainly from that episode with Michael and Satan. And so a couple of things that we learn, character things, I should have said at the beginning, humility we learn, meekness we learn, and then we also learn about patience. Patience from the angels. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, Peter writes, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels longed to look. 
So in this passage, Peter is explaining the great advantage that we, well, the Christians of that time, but also us today, the great advantage that we have in knowing the full revelation of God in Christ. We know the gospel, we know what was hidden, we know how God was going to save us, you know, we know all of this, they didn't. We know God's plan to save us by sending Jesus to die for our sins and then resurrecting from the dead to guarantee our own resurrection from the dead. We know how to respond to God in faith and obedience by repenting and, and being baptized and living a faithful life. We know that Jesus will return to judge and take the church into the heavenly realm forever. We know what's going to happen. We don't know when, but we know what is going to happen. We even know the order in which it's going to happen. We know all these things. But Peter says the prophets who spoke of these things and the angels, you know, the prophets didn't know and the angels longed, they longed to, you know when I say angels have feelings? To long for something. They longed to know what was the plan? How was this thing? How was this thing going to happen? Now we today, we know this and we teach it, we live by it, and it is a constant source of encouragement for us to remain faithful and to remain fruitful in Christ. But Peter is saying that in the Old Testament, the prophets who watched and waited and served and suffered, they didn't know these things. And as I mentioned, even the angels long desired, yearned to know, but they didn't know, despite their exalted position, despite their power. Now the prophets, they lived a short time and then they died. And they wait in sleep for the end to come. The angels, however, they remained conscious and for thousands of years they also had to wait and serve and remain faithful and we know that not all of them did. Remaining faithful is an act of will over a period of time and angels teach us that even the most powerful of beings need to be patient and wait upon the Lord. Someone will say, well, how do we know they even cared? Because Peter, through the power of the Holy Spirit, says of the angels, they longed to look. That's how we know. So the next time you know, we're frustrated because God has not answered our prayer in a week, or because God has not given us the final picture of what He exactly wants us to do or how something is going to turn out and we've been praying all of 27 days for it. The next time that happens, think of the angels who longed to know God's plan and served His purpose and they longed to know His will for thousands of years before their desire was satisfied. And we know their desire is satisfied because the Bible also says that when a sinner repents, who rejoices? The angels rejoice. The angels rejoice. The point to remember here is that eventually their patience was rewarded. And so will our patience be rewarded if we wait upon God. And I've mentioned this to you before. Patience, you know, the virtue of patience is not simply waiting. Because I've seen people wait for stuff, but they're not patient. When's it going to happen? Come on, I've been waiting. You know, you know, I've been praying for this. I, I'm getting so fed up. I wish God would just tell me what's going on. You know, because, uh, and I'm waiting. I'm patient. No, no, that's not, that's not patience. <laughs> That's just waiting. That's just crabbiness. That's me when I'm waiting for supper. <laughs> yeah. Patience, patience is the willingness, the willingness to wait without murmur, without complaint. True patience is the desire to wait in a way that is pleasing to God. 
you know, one prayer that we could make that would be answered and that would be so legitimate would be, dear Lord, please, please help me wait upon you patiently. Please allow me to wait in a way which is pleasing to you. Because even if I die in the middle of my waiting, my waiting has honored you. Because sometimes the only ministry we get to do is to wait. Simply to wait. And if we do that in a way which is pleasing to God, we honor Him, we teach those around us, and we edify ourselves. Now hum, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 tells us that angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service to the saints. Notice that the Hebrew writer speaks in the present tense that this is something that angels do in the present era, not just in the past. When he was writing, he says, angels are ministering. In other words, at the time he was writing, inspirationally, he was teaching the idea that angels are ministering spirit. They minister now. It's not just a kind of a, you know, a fun fact from the past. So we're not exactly clear on how they minister to us today. We know that they help us in our work for the church. We know that they help us in protecting us from Satan. We know that they assist us in our living and most, most importantly, they assist us in our dying. They help us in our dying. These are the ways that they help God's people in the past and they may, they may continue to do so today. We do know, however, that their existence is real and dedicated to our personal well-being. We also are able to incorporate some of their characteristics into our own conduct as Christians if we learn to humble ourselves before God as they do. If they who are more powerful than us do, so should we. We learn also to allow our wills to be set by Christ and not in competition to somebody else's will. You know, that's probably why there's no fighting between the millions of angels. Imagine all these powerful beings. The fact that they are meek guarantees that there'll be no, no arguments here. No one angel among the millions of angels is trying to get his own way. If we have what, 400 people or so, give or take, in this congregation, imagine if every single individual in this, every single one in this congregation was completely devoted to knowing and doing God's will above their own will, we would, we would accomplish mighty things. We're already accomplishing many things, but I think we could do many, many many more things. And from them we also learn to be patient, knowing that in due time, God's due time, not our time, the Lord will come and we will finally be released from the death that we experience in this world. We learn one last lesson also, and that is no one escapes judgment, not even the angels. In Jude it says, and angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That also should be a lesson that kind of gives us pause. If even the angels are judged, who are we to think that we will escape judgment? This should teach us to live soberly, to live purely, to live in a way that is dedicated to God, and to live faithfully until the Lord does return. God will judge all, even the angels. So this teaches us that we must be ready when He does come. If this word touches your heart and you know that you're not ready to meet the Lord, 
we do encourage you to humble yourself and to allow the Lord's will to be above your own will and to be meek and to respond to Him in obedience. And the Bible spells out very clearly what that obedience is, to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Christ, to be buried in the waters of baptism. For others it may simply mean to be restored once again to a faithful relationship with God and perhaps a faithful relationship with His church. I've known many people who have consciously broken off their relationship with the church thinking that they can maintain a relationship with the head, which is Christ, but reject the body. That is not so. You cannot have a relationship with the head unless you have a relationship with the body. And so many people have broken their relationship with the body. And if that's you, if that's something that you have struggled with, then I encourage you to be restored to the body so that you can be restored in a proper relationship with the head. As you come, please realize, as I mentioned before, that all the angels in heaven will rejoice if even just one sinner repents of sin this night and comes forward during our song of invitation.